Good evening, members. On behalf of Ladies Study Group, I would first like to wish you all a very happy Ganesh Chaturthi and to welcome you all to a very, very special webinar today. India is a beautifully diverse country. We have 1.4 billion inhabitants and we share thousands of years of history, speak 19,000 mother tongues and express life and culture through a stunning array of food, dance, ceremony, faith, music, and literature. It is therefore perhaps no surprise that a country like ours holds storytelling so close to its soul. And nowhere is this better expressed than through our cinema and Bollywood. It is safe to say that cinema is our national pastime. And for most of us, movies are a very important part of our lives. Movies affect us powerfully because the combined impact of images music, dialogue, lighting, sound, and special effects can elicit deep feelings and help us reflect on our lives and the lives of those around us and on how society and culture operate. And so to understand this synergy that exists between this creativity and its master, I'm so honored to welcome ACE Director and Padma Shri, Mr. Shekhar Kapoor to our screens. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Welcome, Shekhar, and thank you so much for doing this for us. I know you're up in the mountains in the Uttarakhand, and I know you have your connectivity issues, and it's so nice of you to you know, sort it all out and be here with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Shekhar Kapoor's Instagram handle says, it's the picture that captures you and not the other way around. Known for making movies with intelligent narratives and nuanced performances, Shekhar Kapoor is a globally recognized film director, media visionary, and proponent on the future of new media. He is known for his films such as The Cult Masoom, the iconic Mr. India, the seven times Oscar-nominated Elizabeth, Elizabeth the Golden Age, Bandit Queen, Four Feathers, and more. His films have won or been nominated for numerous awards, including the Oscars, the BAFTA, Film Fair Awards, amongst others. He has executive produced the Bollywood-themed Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, Mumbai Dreams, as well as films such as The Guru for Universal Studios. He set up Virgin Comics and Virgin Animation with Richard Branson and Deepak Chopra. He also sits on a number of boards and advisory committees. He was given one of India's highest civilian state awards, the Padma Shri, for his service to media in the nation. I would now like to welcome Shekhar Kapoor's younger sister and our moderator for today, Sohela Khan, so Sohela Kapoor to us, to our screens. I'm sorry about that. Hello. Hi, well, welcome Sohela. Thank, Thank you, you for so much for doing this for us. Writer. Writer, playwright, actress, director, television producer, Sohela Kapoor dons several roles simultaneously while continually adding to her experience as a jury member for the National Television Awards. After pursuing a master's degree in political science, she went on to become a journalist. The 90s saw her return to the theater with her becoming a stage director and playwright. She wrote a musical, Ye Hai Mumbai Mary Jaan, which was the first one marrying Bollywood to the stage and opened at the Edinburgh Fringe. And we have all watched her recently perfectly essay the role of Sushmita Sen's mother, Rajeshwari, in the super successful web series, Arya. So Shekhar and Sohela, I believe this is a first for both of you, the first time that you both are on screen together. And we have you, Shekhar, being interviewed by our own baby sister. So can we know a little more about your journey growing up? How was it growing up together? Do share some light, Shekhar. Um, I was the bully. <laughs> all older brothers are. And um, I was probably more of a bully than actually I realized I was. At that time, it sounded like a lot of fun. But it probably left Sohela a little bit scarred, the bullying. But I think all elder brothers do that. Not all, but it's a very Indian thing also, the family thing to bully the younger sister. <laughs> it used to give me great pleasure. It did not give her any pleasure, I'm pretty sure. But there was. 
That's it was. I was a bully. No, it's the first time you're confessing it, <laughs> and I accept it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I was. I used to be hurt at that point, but later. When I go back to those uh, incidents, I enjoy them actually. I have a good laugh. Sometimes I share them, you know, on the family group, and he has a laugh also, and so does everybody else. Oh, it's all part of growing up. It also uh, maybe toughened me a bit, and um, it certainly made him an idol for me. I don't know why bullying does this. Bullying by older brothers, but I started looking up to him. I started resenting him and looking up to him. You know, both the contradictory things happen together. And soon there came a time when I just wanted to be like him, you know. And of course, the bully in him said, "Why do you have to keep following me? Why do you have to do things that I'm doing all the time?" Till very recently, and I thought I said, "Am I something like that? Like I did a hundred years ago? Or maybe I am. You know, it's a habit." So then I chucked it after a while, and after I had my own achievements, I did. Uh, I, I I chucked it, hopefully, for good. <laughs> but it just shows the impact he had on me as an older brother and the bully. Yes, it had its positive aspects too. So I'm going to leave it to you, Nasa Hela, to take it from here. Yeah. You know, Bhai, I'm going to call you Bhaiya because my mother taught me always. I remember as a kid calling him Shekhar once, and I got it from my mother. She said, "You never call your older brother by his name," and that thing stuck till now. So even now, I call him Bhaiya. It's very difficult when I for me to call him Shaker when people say you know we want to talk to Shaker can you and I have to formally sort of speak to him which is you know one of those rare incidents then I say Shaker and it's like I've got marbles in my mouth I feel like saying Bhaiya <laughs> anyway I've often wondered what made you decide to drop that education as a chartered accountant and you at 27 I remember were the young was the youngest. You were the youngest partner of a British firm, Needham and Company. I remember. What made you give that up and a hugely bright future? You had a beautiful British model as a girlfriend. I remember. What made you come back and decide to drop it all and join films? I don't think I saw you reading a single book on films or even watching movies with us. I was the one who's fond of movies, not you. Um, I was twenty-four actually, not twenty-seven. Um, okay. uh yeah you know i've never made a decision in my life when i left i decided that there was one word i was going to take out of my life and that word was called career i think i resented the idea of this middle class idea that every young indian middle class boy has to be an engineer or doctor or an accountant it didn't mean anything to me right and i couldn't see me as the rest of my life as an accountant So I decided that I was going to go on a life of adventure. The decision was not to join films. The decision was to go out in exploration of myself. Now, if you'd ask me at 24, can you explain it? I, I can explain it now. But at 24, I was just looking for adventure. I left, and I started to roam the world looking for adventure, and I fell into movies. That's so you're right. I I, I had no interest. I even mean, I like movies, but I. My first film, Masoom. I'd never been an assistant director. I'd never studied a book on filming. I'd never been to a studio. I'd never been to an editing studio. I'd never done anything. I just said, "No, That's interesting. I'll make a movie." Like a lot of other things that I do, I just they just come across me and I do them. So there's never been a decision to make films. It just happened. Is it like a? Yeah. Is it like a download? They just come. It's like musicians when they compose. They don't know how it happened. Yeah. I think that we need to get into a more serious discussion about what time it is. Is it more linear, or is it uh, circular, or is it the same thing? Is time? Does it even exist? So yes, uh, a decision comes, and a decision is downloaded. And what you do is you open yourself up to a path, an unknown path. You keep walking this unknown path wherever you go, and you walk the path that you walk. There's been no idea that that's I'm going to walk that path, and if you just allow yourself to be completely vulnerable, vulnerability is the key. Uh, you're an adventurer. You have to be tough, but you have to be so vulnerable. You have to be so vulnerable to understand where the moment is taking you, to experience where. Not even understand. That's the wrong word. The word is experience. Experience where the next step is taking you, 
and observe the next step. And somehow I've always done that. I just experience the next step and then fallen into doing something. So when people say, you know what I mean? So it's always been just trying to experience being in the moment, the moment. But even the moment is wrong because even moment is a measure of time. So really, it's a cliche now, but to be in the now, because now is not a measure of time. Because by the time I've made this statement to you, the now is gone. You know? So it's just to be in the now, all the, every now be in the now. I was going to say every moment be in the now, but then again, I'm using a measure of time when I say a moment. Um, so that's been the journey. You talked about vulnerability. Um, you had quite a struggle. You know, you came yeah. here, you wanted to be good looking. You had Dev uncle who was our maternal uncle who promised you a break and said, you're a good looking guy. I'll give you a break in my film, which was ish, ish, ish. Things didn't work out uh, as an actor. Were you vulnerable at that time to hurt and to the fact that you may have joined the wrong profession? Did you ever feel that? I didn't come here to be an actor. So I didn't oh. join a profession. You know, okay. I was just carried by that moment and I did it. Um, yeah, because he offered it to you. Yeah. Hmm. No, no, it just happened. You know, he offered, I was there. I had a big crush on Zina Taman, so I did it. You know what I mean? It was my uncle. Yeah. So, um, what is, I'm not, um, I'm looking back, of course, if you're vulnerable, you're going to get hurt. You know, the, the fear of getting hurt is uh, one of the biggest challenges that people face when they are making, you know, life decisions. They just, you have to be okay to get hurt. It's part of being alive. It's part, your heart gets hurt. But there's a difference between being hurt in the mind and being hurt in the heart, you know. Uh, and being hurt in the mind is ego being hurt in the heart is life you know what i mean so there's a difference and i used to get hurt in the heart and i still get hurt in the heart all the time and i try to keep it away from my ego because we have creative egos and personal egos creative egos belong to the heart personal ego belongs to the mind and i think that what i've been able to do is stay away from my mind too much all my life Right. And that's to me, if I look back, has been what my life has been like is mindless in a way. And it's just, yeah, I got hurt. I keep getting hurt. I still get hurt all the time. It's fine. It's fine. If you don't accept being hurt, you won't do anything. You won't take any challenges. You won't go on an adventure. You won't fall in love. Yeah. Most people will come to me and say, oh, I don't want to fall in love. I don't want to express my love because I might get hurt. So I'm asking them. What is getting hurt? What is getting hurt? When you don't express your love, your heart is hurting more than if you get hurt because it doesn't it because it falls apart. It's a mind. It's the ego of rejection. It's the fear of rejection. You have to get over the fear of rejection. You have to get over the fear of failure. Failure and rejection are part of achievement and glory. They're all part of the same thing. Right, you can't go on being glorious all the time. You can't be all, you know, look, I'm successful. Then you ask yourself, well, what do you mean by this keyword called successful? What does that mean? It means that I'm looking at myself reflected off other people's eyes, and that's a mind game. The heart game is whatever is will go, and whatever is not will come. Do you know what I'm saying? So why did you decide to do Masu? I didn't decide it happened. Um, I was, uh, see, it just, I was going to do a film. I had a financer who said, oh, I think you'll make a good director. I said, okay, I'll do that. And uh, we had another story in mind. I went to the fine, uh, financer's house. The producer took me there, David Ath, And I decided to narrate him the story. And uh, I saw him yawn. And like, you know, like Krishna's mother saw in Krishna's mouth as Krishna yawned the whole universe, I saw in his mouth 
the end of my career that hadn't started. <laughs> I saw boredom as he yawned. And uh, it suddenly changed the story. I just in the midway started to tell a different story that I had not thought of. I saw a lot of kids photographs on his shelf. And about six months ago, I had read this book called Man, Woman and Child. And I don't know why something connected. And I started to narrate a different story that I had not even thought of to him. And he said, and my producer was kicking me under the table because the producer didn't know what I was saying. But what the producer didn't know is I didn't know what I was saying. It just that's what I mean. It happened. It just happened. It was just at that moment I told the story and he loved it. And Masu was right. And the rest so is history. The rest is history, yeah. Or not. How much, yeah. No, How much the film? I tell you why not, Suhela, because there is no art that ever gets completed. There's nothing there's historical no? art that mm. ever gets completed. There are no full stops in any art. So you see a film, you'll see Masum today, somebody will see it and they'll take Masum forward because it goes forward in their subconscious, in their mind. You know, so why do we say that as a film ban gai? You know, no art actually finishes. There are no full stops in art. You know, I see. Strange a, you say that. Yeah. yeah. Because Stanislavski said the same thing that there's no end to yeah. art, it's a continuity. Yeah. You keep learning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's right then. He's absolutely right. So Van Gogh made a painting were. called Starry Nights, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite painting. Every time I see even a picture on the internet of Starry Nights, I'm taking it forward. You know, so it may have, it was maybe painted by him, but it continues in people's subconscious and each one is interpreting it differently and differently and differently. We've only thought of ends now because of something called the Gutenberg Press. Mahabharat was being told, you know, before it was published, there must be a million versions of Mahabharat. Each one Mahabharat, each one being told and being told and retold and retold and everybody else going home with different stories. My remember our grandmother Mataji used to tell us stories. Yeah. And then those stories became different beings in our minds and our hearts. Now I can't even remember. Yeah, I remember her telling me the story, but I don't know what the story was because I owned it and I took it forward. So there was mm -hmm. no end to the story ever. There's no end to any story. Mm -hmm. So how much of Masum was autobiographical? Your childhood maybe? I saw bits of the relationship between daddy and you. In the relationship between the child and his father, played by Nazir. Um, yeah, my my relationship was hiking, was climbing my, mountains. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, my dad used to take me there, and I always wondered when he used to take me there that what if I have a son? How would I respond? So a lot of that came in between Nasir and 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 Jugal Ansaraj. This mm -hmm. idea of what how would I play if I had a son? Then of course the two daughters were, I was from modern school, so you saw they were wearing modern school uniforms. And uh, I remember these lines, uh, these vegetables that I used to hate as a kid and all kids hated. So I turned them into abuses, you know, you could do, you tip, you alu, you could do, you bang them. You know, so these are little, little things that come to your mind as you're writing a scrap and, 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 yeah. and, and or as you're perf getting actors to perform. And so, you flow out to the actors and the actors flow back to you. You don't tell the actors what to do. In fact, I remember Masum is, I would allow the children to play and say things and I would film what they were doing. That was it. Mr. India, did you never feel or were you never told that this is a fantastic idea that will never work in India? All the time. Mm -hmm. All the time I was told that. It's unusual for its time. It's unusual even today. Yeah. All the time I was being told, you look pagal again. You know, he used to tell Boni Kapoor, to pagal hai to director Shekhar Kapoor ke liye usne dusre masoom kiya hai to ye kya kar raha But I loved, I just made Mr. India because I was playing. And so it looks like play. I was just playing. I, with every film, I do remember that with every film that I do, I become a personality. I'm either, I'm the character. When I'm doing Mogambo, I'm Mogambo. When I'm doing... Masum, I'm Nasir. I'm also Jugal. I'm also Kate Blanchett, you know, because how else do I find a character unless a character exists inside me? So all the characters I've done exist inside me and I just allow them to come out. But uh, Mr. India was a lot of play. I, I remember there was this ele little 11 year old kid sitting next to me uh, who was me. 
my mini me. And each time I would take a shot, I would kind of ask him, "Kaisa tha? Are you boring tha yar? Tujhe tu tu puta ho gaya." So I would change the shot. So there was a constant conversation going on because I wanted to play. Yeah. So we played, and I think that's why the film is still fresh. It looks like people were playing, and that's the idea because because we were playing, that play keeps going forward, and that's why Mr. India is one of the most constantly watched films on television. Again and again, people watch it. Because it reminds you of play when you were a child. Also, video games today. Yeah. I find it a lot like a video game today. Yeah, yeah, a lot of that. Yes. Okay, you had two successes behind you, and then why did you opt for uh, Bandit Queen? You didn't make another Bollywood film. Uh, Bandit was... Queen was a cross between the British company, and it was produced by a British company, Channel Four. Yeah, it was funded by Channel Four. Funded by them, yeah. I was I was doing another film that I was being told by the producers how to shoot it, what to do, and I was thinking, oh, yeah, I I don't want to do that. And I was first uh, when I was offered this film, it was offered to me as a docu drama. I said, I don't know how to make a docu drama. I'll just make a feature. They said, Fine, if you can do it. So it was quite low budget. And we went along and we made the film again. I think that. Recently, um, somebody wanted me to do a commentary on Bandit Queen, and uh, I saw the film again to do the commentary or write something. And I came out. My assistants found me crying, and I. They asked me, "So why am I crying?" And I said, "I don't think I'll ever make a film like this again, because that was me then, and I thought it was such an honest film. And but it was who was the filmmaker?" I couldn't understand who the filmmaker was. You know, often you can't. You're not there. You disappeared. You're not in the frame. You've disappeared. And that the, that man that made Bandit Queen, and the man that was watching and sobbing for himself, that was me. After the film, saying, "I wonder if I'll ever make a film like this. I would like to, but who was I?" So the you know everything conspired in the universe to come together to make these films. And I was part of the conspiracy of the universe. I wasn't the filmmaker. I was a conspiracy of the universe in everything that I've ever done. It's a conspiracy of the universe, and I accept that. I accept to be part of the conspiracy of the universe. Was uh, Elizabeth also a part of the conspiracy of the universe when you introduced the Kate Blanchett, who was in a, you know, little-known film called Oscar and Lucinda, if I'm not uh, mistaken, an Australian film. And you decided to give her the, the 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 role of this glamorous, this glamorous and hugely important queen for Britain. How did you decide that? Um, I I knew that there was something that I was looking for. That the actor had to have a sense of the now and a sense of the past, and a sense of being in of the earth. And of the spirit, you know, because that was the journey of the actor, and I was kept looking for that, and I, I almost got fired of the film because I wouldn't decide on the actor, I wouldn't decide on the on the production designer, because I knew I didn't want the world to look like that world. I wanted the world to look like the, the world of the story that I'm telling. I wasn't even telling the story for Elizabeth. I was adapting the story for Elizabeth to what I, to me. What was the biggest, most important thing at that time is, why do women have to declare themselves virgins to have power? That was, to me, yeah, that was to me the most important thing of the film. Why do women have to? Why did Elizabeth have to say, "I'm the Virgin Queen"? And how do you know? How does she know that she was a virgin? How does the history know? So I played the history and said she wasn't a virgin at all. She was actually used virginity to get power over men, and I was in. Quite influenced by this this thought of why men dress like men and why women had to. I know they don't now, but at that time, why they had to dress like men to become powerful women. And uh, so, when I saw Kate Blanchett, I knew that was the girl. If you had asked me at that time, why do you know? I said, uh, I just know. You know, I've just seen everything. And it was a fight. It was my first film outside India. My first film in the English language. I'd never spent more than a million, half a million dollars or something in a film, <laughs> even less. This was twenty-five million dollars, and and uh, I never, I didn't even know how to spend twenty-five million dollars. 
I have never seen $25 million. So uh, they wanted a star and I said, I was told by my agent that if you keep insisting on an unknown girl, nobody knew who Kate Blanchard was. If yes. I keep insisting on an unknown girl, then you'll probably get fired. They'll take another director. So I got scared for like one evening. I woke up in the morning and I asked myself, is Kate Blanchard in your destiny or is she not in your destiny? I'll have to ask the universe. And the universe conspired to tell me that she is. So I called my agent and said, okay, let them find me. I'm going to insist on Kate Blanchett, and that's that's been my life. And she became you a star after that. She's doing yeah. very well even now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, huge. She's still a huge star. She's a huge star. She's after Elizabeth. Yeah. She got nominated both times for both Elizabeths, right? Yeah, yeah. She just got the Emmy or uh, right now, a few days ago, for Mrs. America. Or Miss, yeah, Mrs. America. Captain America. No, no, Mrs. America is a series. Okay. Or, yeah. Okay. Now, um, you know, although it was critically acclaimed, it, uh, it was nominated for seven Oscars, there was a criticism uh, abroad in America, um, uh, no, in Britain, I think, that you Indianized the sentiments in that film, that there was a bit of Bollywood in that Hollywood film. So how did you tackle that? Well, I remember New York Times said, Oh, it's like an MTV film, and I took that as a great. Uh, I didn't even realize there was a criticism. It wasn't Indianized; it was Easternized. You know, it looked like an Eastern Chinese or a Eastern film or a Japanese or an Indian film. I didn't Bollywoodize it. But then, who am I? How could I make a completely Western film? I'm not Western. I I, I wouldn't know how to do it. You know. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it turned out to be an Eastern film. And, but I think that the success of the film was because I didn't try and make it into a, a British film, you know, a British film. And I actually resisted trying to, uh, Elizabeth, having, I, I said, no, no, no. And somehow it just happened that I did it because I didn't know how to make a historical. I knew nothing about Elizabeth when I said ultimately started on it. Kate Blanchett knew more. Every actor of mine knew more about Elizabeth than I did. I just wanted to tell a different story that resonated with me. So how did they come back to you again and say, now you can make uh, uh, Elizabeth II, Golden Age? Well, because I've made the first one. And I, I resisted making the second one too. But then my agent said, come on. And everybody said, let's do it. And I said, okay, let's do it. There's no, you know, in my life, there's never been this firm... Let's do this. And I fought. I fought yeah. once the yeah. film came on. And the only film I fought for a long time, long time is Pani. And uh, mm -hmm. it's not being made. Maybe I am fighting too hard, but that's because I think we are, it's, we are, as far as war is concerned, we've passed the danger zone. And I had started, started to study the environment a lot about 20 years ago. And then I soon realized that actually, the biggest issue in the world is water. And I started to examine it. In fact, the reason I'm in Uttarakhand now is because I had gone to Milam Glacier in a place called Munsiari. It's one of the largest glaciers that are still in India and, <clears throat> and fast retreating, fast retreating glaciers. And I decided that I would go on a trip photographing glaciers because from 20 years before to now, they've gone. I wanted to record all the glaciers. So 20 years from now, people can see how the glaciers have all retreated. And the, um, I mean, I was trying to tell people this is happening. And then I became a big water advocate and I didn't know how, how to get through to people. And I remember I, I was in one seminar and I said, and that got everybody's attention. What do you mean, Ganga nahi bahegi? Said, ya suki rahegi, ya baal hogi. Baal mein hogi. Then everybody stood up and then I talked to them about glaciers. So I, I realized that actually I have to tell the story and make awareness about water through mythological means. And then I started to write it. Yeah, it was quite fascinating to write the story of water in the future. But it's not just about water. It's the way of our world. Ultimately, Pani is about a world in the future where water becomes a socio, social and a political weapon and people control others. People who have water control those that don't. And only 10% people have the power of water. So it's also democracy is 
अच्छा हम आपको पानी देंगे आप हमें वोट दो सो आई वाज थिंकिंग विद दैट काइंड ऑफ वर्ल्ड व्हाई डिड द फिल्म नेवर गेट मेड हु नोस आई डोंट नो व्हेन इट वाइट स्टिल इन द फ्यूचर राइट व्हाट स्टिल टुमारो आई डोंट नो आई डोंट नो व्हाट द फ्यूचर इज but it might get worse but the people that i was making the film for ultimately i realized it and they realized that we were thinking completely differently what cinema is uh to them and to me it's a different thing what it was not my creative endeavor anymore it was their creative endeavor or their business endeavor so i just it's okay one day will it'll come back to me so what's the what are the future plans what are you working on now i don't know I work on 25 things at the same time. One of them will happen. You, so you, what are you doing in Uttarakhand? You've been there for many months ever since the lockdown. Yeah, I'm here waiting for the lockdown to end. And uh, of course COVID has changed everybody's world, but I came here to Munsiari to photograph the glaciers. But to trek to the glaciers and start photographing them and then the lockdown happened and then yeah, I've been here since the lockdown waiting for things to ease out. deciding where my next film is going to be or where my next project is going to be and it might be in london it might be in the us so where to fly to i don't think it'll be the us now but if it's in london then i have to go to london if it's in bombay i have to go to bombay if it's in delhi i have to go to delhi so are you more spiritual from... yeah are you more so, spiritual well. person today than you were maybe a decade ago All right, so what is spiritualism mind. to you that's what i mean i think the biggest danger is that when people turn spirituality into intellectuality in intellectuality that's dangerous and that's a lie you know anybody who says to you i know is lying to you the only truth in this world in this whole vast cosmic system and in our existence the only three true words that i don't know there is the only truth of life of creativity of existence of spirituality i don't know but i'm in what i call not on the journey to discover because that itself becomes like oh i'm in the journey to discover uh it's i'm in yearning i'm constantly in yearning constantly in yearning and i have been since i was 11 um, you remember in in uh, nizamuddin you were very young we you used to sleep in in summer on the kota on the get bunkers oh on the kota on the terrace that's right on the terrace yeah yeah and night in the summers the, yeah if you at that time in delhi the the skies were clean there was no dust pollution there was no noise pollution there was no light pollution and i used to look out um onto the stars and i could see the milky way at that time you know from that at night you're staring at the milky way you're staring at the stars and i kept wondering how far it goes how far does this go How far does this go? How far does it go? And and in we were just learning physics in school, and school was teaching us that for anything to be something, it has to be measurable. You know, that's the first thing you tell you in physics: length, breadth, height, this, everything, gravity. Everything is a measure. So I remember asking mom, "Mom, ये कहाँ तक जाता है?" And she said, "Better it goes on forever." मैं रात रात सोता नहीं था रोता था कि ये फॉर है क्या चीज ये फॉर एवर वट इज फॉर एवर एंड हाउ कम आई एम बींग टोल्ड दैट एवरीथिंग इफ इट एग्जिस्ट इट्स हैज टू बी मेजरेबल एंड आई कॉन्ट मेजर फॉर एवर नाउ ओवर टाइम सो इट स्टार्टेड देन वन एज इलेवन दैट्स वेर आई मेड माई फर्स्ट स्टोरी कि अब अगर फॉर एवर नहीं है तो फिर एक एक्स मैन है वो पेड़ तोड़ रहा है वो एक्स के कोने में एक कोने में एक गैलेक्सी है उस गैलेक्सी के अंदर एक वो है एक है और अर्थ है अर्थ के अंदर वो दिल्ली है दिल्ली के अंदर एक कोठा है कोठे में एक चार पाई है चार पाई में मैं बैठा हूँ सोच रहा हूँ कि फॉर एवर क्या है लेकिन मेरे अंदर भी चार पाई में एक और यूनिवर्स है तो ऐसी कहानी बताता रहता था बात बताता रहता था बोलता रहता था अल्टीमेटली आई नाउ रियलाइज आई वॉज टेलिंग स्टोरीज अबाउट ऑफ द यूनिटी ऑफ ऑल इटर्निटी यू नो आई डेंट रियलाइज इट देन So the uh, right now I'm still that kid in search of forever. Now I wouldn't say I'm in search. I would take the word search out. I would say I'm in yearning. Like how you're in yearning for love, you're in yearning for creativity. Creativity is also a, a yearning. Everything's a yearning, and when the yearning stops, you're dead. 
your mind dies, your heart dies. You know, so the yearning keeps going. So, Katera, I fall in love, I, I found the answer. If you found the answer, and some of you have found the answer, so what are you yearning for? And how do you know the answer? You know, you say, I know. Okay, then finish it. You die. Your life is over. Everything you if you know that. So, yearning. Yearning. And more yearning. And constant yearning. And forever yearning. Forever yearning. Forever. Whatever forever is in yearning is basically who I am. What have the Himalayas taught you? I think that the, there's places that have an energy. You know, sometimes it's perceived energy. I perceive the energy and I impose that energy on those places. Sometimes I feel that I'm at a place which has a fundamental energy. And that energy may be the unity of the universe. of I am in the house in the house. Now, circularity is The house I am in is a house that I came to look for locations during Masoom. And I was on During Masoom? During Masoom. And I thought, so this. And then I met one of the family, daughter of now, probably she was not even born when I was there. Right? She said, you're very famous in my family. I said, how? And she said, you came to this house, look for locations, and then you went swimming with some once one one of the young girls from the family in the in the lake, and and they had to come with guns looking for you. Now, of course, I said, "Well, why did you look for guns?" And, and she laughed and I said, "Listen, because there's a lot of leopards in this area. They must have come to see if we're okay." But that's the house I'm in. They run a homestay here, you know. And then the other day, I went for a long walk. I was walking and walking, and somebody said, go see that lake at Sattar. So I kept walking. Couple. On the way, I saw a small lake. And I was very attracted to that lake. But it was really very low. I'm not as, you know, I'm not 20 anymore. I'm not 70s. I said, Chalo, because going down too fast is a big pressure on your legs and knees and knees. But I went. I said, this is a beautiful lake. And I said, Chalo, us taraf jata So I walked around the lake. And I came to the other side of the lake and I knew that that place was calling me. I had no idea why. Why am I here? Why am I coming here? Why am I coming here? And suddenly dawned on me. I was here in Masoom. 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 That was a place. So, I remember that shot. Yeah. So I thought, why is this place calling me? लेकिन बुला रही है अब मैं इसको ज्यादा रीजनेबल बोलूंगा तो सब कहेंगे अच्छा कोई स्पिरिचुअल बात है मैं कहता हूं नहीं कुछ कॉस्मिक बात है ऐसे कुछ हुआ हो गया पर वो जगह मैंने थी सो इट वाज कॉलिंग मी द एनर्जीज वर कॉलिंग मी सो समटाइम्स द एनर्जी द प्ले ऑफ एनर्जीज इन द एंड द द पुल एंड पुश एंड पुल ऑफ एनर्जी एंड डेस्टिनी व्हाटएवर डेस्टिनी इज माय डॉटर कावेरी यू नो why am I telling you? She and I had a big call, uh, chat the other day. She's 19, 18, 19, when she was saying, Dad, what's destiny? And I said, I don't know. But if you accept destiny, you have to accept that there's linearity in time. But maybe everything is happening in the same moment. Maybe all of time is not existent. Maybe time is just in our imagination, which even science is saying now, that the future affects the present. How could the future ex affect the presence, present unless the present and the future are the same? And if you read quantum physics, you realize that they've made these experiments that completely go with the fundamental mysticism of our Upanishads. Fundamental mysticism which says, like Krishna said in, in the Gita, And then he goes on to explain the fact that everything is a moment of eternity, just the now of eternity. And if you either accept as 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 in our, your mind, can you accept the uh, the narrative of it? Of course, we can all. It's the intellectual narrative, but can you experience it? Can you experience the unity of eternity? That's the issue. And but that's where, if you say spirituality, it is to me spirituality is not. I'm not there. I've experienced this two or three times but in moments, right? 
So spirituality to me is the yearning for the experience of the unity of all eternity. I know it's a very complicated thing, but I don't know how else to expri- uh, explain No, it. no, I understand it. Yeah, yeah, I do. So, during these experiences, maybe now in these six months, did you ever feel that you wanted to move on and like you moved out of your career in chartered accountancy, you were looking for adventure? Are you still looking for adventure? Could be spiritual adventure. Do you want to move out of this phase of filmmaking and being an entertainer now? Did you ever feel that? Um... I don't know, Sohila. Nothing is more important than anything. You know, I am as important to the universe as a piece of dust. If if in the structure of the whole universe, an ant is taken out, the universe will collapse. If I'm taken out, the universe will collapse. So my presence in the whole scheme of things is nothing but a mere presence and an imagination, a perception. You know, as I'm looking at you through the screen, I'm telling myself a story. You're my sister. I'm perceiving you. I'm perceiving you. But perhaps in the whole, maybe you are not and I am not. And we've just perceived ourselves as individuals. Maybe this is not happening right now. Maybe I've just perceived it. It's all in my, it's all about perception. Right? So your question was, what am I planning to do in the future? See, we say a film is a big thing, a hit film is a big thing. But why is it a bigger thing than the idea of an ant moving in a little piece of grass? I often stare at ants, you know, piece of grass and say, why do I feel Mr. India is bigger than that little ant moving in the grass? It's not. Actually, both, both are events of their own kind and have no importance in the structure or the, the eternity of all of the universe. Nothing. There's nothing. We just give ourselves importance because we are overburdening ourselves with the idea of individuality. Why uh, we say, yeah, what's the purpose of life? And I'm saying to myself, it's life itself. And if the purpose of life is life itself, then the purpose of the film is the film itself. The purpose of taking a step forward is the step itself. The purpose of creating, I'm looking out of my the window here, and I'm seeing a leaf, and why does leaf, a leaf not ask me, ask itself the same question? The purpose of the leaf is no less important than my purpose. Maybe and I am the leaf, I am the tree, the tree is me. We all are interconnected with the same sense of being, you know. But just because we move and, you know, uh, so many other concepts. So like, this is getting too complicated and too complex. No, you know, I, I, uh, I understand quite a bit of what you're saying because I remembered, I have a very strong memory of being a three-year-old in the Zamudin West. And I remember... Remember, there was a banyan tree right outside behind the street where we lived. And it had beautiful leaves that fluttered in the wind and uh, with the sunshine, like the golden sunshine we have today with clear skies in Delhi today. And I remember stopping in my tracks. We used to have our toilets outside in the courtyard and staring at those glimmering leaves, shivering in the breeze. And I felt the pleasure of the leaf. I just accepted it as a three-year-old. And when the memory came back to me, it was a very strange feeling. How did I feel I was the leaf? A three-year-old. And then my mind told me, maybe it is a kind of a meditative state that I entered at that time where the intellect had not developed. And I felt the unity of things. I actually felt the shivering pleasure of the tree, of the leaf, which is dancing on the branch with the light, sunlight glancing off it. I felt its pleasure and that's what stopped me going to the toilet. And I also remember the full moon over there. It entranced me. Remember, mommy used to send me to the toilet at night to, uh, you know, punish me sometimes and I wouldn't eat my food. And I remember doing the same thing, stopping in my tracks and the huge full moon that would rise above the wall of our backyard. And I would be entranced. You know, it's a feeling I've often wondered why it didn't come back in one's adulthood. I'll tell you why, because... When children are born, they're born without prejudice. Without? And prejudice. Yeah. Without a great sense of individuality. And what we do is we teach children to be prejudiced. What we call education is only prejudice. Yeah. What we call learning is only prejudice. So we keep teaching them to be more and more. All our education is prejudice. And we keep 
teaching ourselves and our kids, and I was taught to be prejudiced. Maybe at 24, that's why I wanted to get rid of prejudice. So uh, all children, the birth of a child is the birth of a star, is the birth of a cosmos, is the birth of a neutron star, is the birth of, it's the Big Bang. It's all of that. And as a child's mind, we'll have understood all of that without the idea of knowing what a Big Bang is. But a child's mind senses that there is a universe and I'm part of that and I'm not. And we treat the child gradually to be burdened with individuality. And, we and duality. Them. And duality, yeah. absolutely. Who say Atana duality, prejudice say. Yeah. Have you ever thought of a film script with all these experiences that you've been having, your thoughts on singularity, on quantum physics? Have you Are thought of a story? Are you, huh? me, Atata. If a film is not about yearning and if yearning is spirituality, then every film that I ever made has a yearning to it. So who you are and what you're thinking, you just in every creative thing that you do, it passes through you. And through as it passes through you, it passes into what is being created. And I've decided not to use the word what I've created. What got what was created. And because I was part of the creation of that, so part of me went into that. So whoever I am, whether spiritual or or masculine or boring or too intellectual or whatever it is, has seeped into that. What do you think is the role of ego today? Well, the because there's been a lot of discussion on arrogance and ego, particularly in the context of the film industry these days. So, you know, there's a creative ego and there's a personal ego. You know, creative ego is the desire to explore creativity. And that's a very good ego. A personal ego is the great block. The creative ego is like the, a river that's in constant flow. In fresh and constant flow and goes deeper and deeper and deeper. That's creative ego. Um, uh, personal ego is a, a river damped and festering. You know, so creative big. ego is good. Oh, it's fantastic. That's it what is. you're saying. A creative ego is the ego of asking questions. A creative ego is the ego of yearning. Well, you see, I found two new words. So three, I found a new phrase. I'll use it in my social media. The ego of yearning is the creative ego. Right. Whereas the personal ego is the ego of blocking. Of? Blocking. Blocking. Blocking the flow. Yeah. Damn because the river goes like that. It's a person who is ego blocking. I think we can call Dia back into the discussion now. <laughs> if she's still there, Dia. <laughs> We've been chatting for 45 minutes, I think. <laughs> yeah. It's been so, so Dia. beautiful. Yes. Yeah. It has been amazing and so beautiful to hear you both. You know, this beautiful sibling bond. It's so precious. And thank you for sharing it with all of us. and being. Thank so you kind. for bringing us together because we've never spoken like this. Before. I know. So that's what we said. <laughs> really beautiful. So, Sahela, you said that Shekhar had, you know, he was a chartered accountant and then he moved into firms. And you said that he was your role model. So is that why you also moved from journalism into acting? Have you followed no. his footsteps? <laughs> and no, no, actually what he said, it just happened to me uh, in, in high school, I was asked to do a play. I was frightened out of my mind. I remember I froze on stage and forgot my lines and I almost got kicked by the teacher who was sort of, you know, uh, prompting me from the wings. But then something happened to me and I wanted to do more of it. I just fell in love with the stage. I just felt it fulfilled a part of me. And then I was also learning dancing. And then my mother, you know, who couldn't fulfill her dreams of being a dancer and a singer because they got married early at that age. And the performing arts were really not meant for the for the for girls, um, for girls from middle class families. She fulfilled that desire by putting me into dance school and music school. And I did theater on my own. So the three arts came together in me and uh, urged me, urged me to carry on, uh, uh, carry on my uh, love affair with them. You know, and that's how I continued doing theater. Continued learning dancing and music, and when I we we uh, I was one of the four people who uh, created uh, Ruchika Theatre Group. It was Faisal Alkazi, Alkazi son, Alkazi just passed away. E Alkazi, the great uh, acting master, the maestro. Faisal Alkazi, me and my best friend Malati Khanna, Krishna Khanna, the artist Krishna Khanna's daughter, who's now Malati Shah, 
and uh, Arun Kukureja. He's a director who's passed away, theater, well-known theater director in Delhi. We created Ruchika Theater Group, which is still running after so many years. This must be 40 years now. So it was the love of theater, which never left me. I, you know, it still compels me. It's like a compulsion. A lot of time, my own brother has told me, a lot of friends, Ki, kya kamati is se? You know, it's a waste of time. Do something where you earn money. So what I started doing, I, I, uh, I started to be a journalist. I became a professional journalist. I joined the Times of India. And uske saath jo mujhe salary milti thi, I would sink into my theater endeavors. And that's with me still. Still. These 40 years, it's been with me. And maybe because I was an actor and there's all these modern technologies that opened up. There was television. There was this, you know, these web serials. I started getting offers for, um, for um, you know, scripts. So that's how I did movies. I did web series. Uh, television, I've just been an anchor. I've never done a tele serial. So I look at it as an extension of theatre. And I did it on my own. I, my brother's never done theatre except once. I think he directed a musical. Two, he directed a musical in Germany and was a producer of Bombay Dreams. He didn't direct it. But I've been an actor and director and producer in theatre for 30, 40 years. Amazing. So it was a compulsion, like filmmaking was a compulsion for him. Theatre was and is a compulsion for me. Yes, and you have a lot it of It just fans discovered me. It discovered me. That's it. And you have a lot of fans watching you today. I know that. I know that for a They must be his fans. <laughs> Both. <laughs> so, Shekhar, lots of questions have come in from different members. And I'm going to just take a couple because we, do, we are short on time. So, yeah. Dr. Moshmi Ghosh is asking. Because my sister talks too much. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Moshmi Ghosh is asking, are you the eternal outsider? Or do you feel every moment is a different moment? Um, every moment is a different moment. The moment that that moment is gone, the previous moment actually is baggage. The previous moment is like a ship in anchor and has forgotten to or is unwilling to let go of the anchor. That's what happens to us all the time. You have to be very conscious that not get addicted to the snapshot that was the previous moment. You look at that snapshot and say, ah, yeah, but it's gone. It's just a snapshot and you yeah. cannot move forward but because we are addicted to our anchors. So yes, every moment is, has to be, must be a moment that did not exist before the moment. In fact, you know what I do a lot is when I'm directing, uh, because I'm spending so much of other people's money and because uh, I have to be aware. So I plan, I plan, I plan, I plan, I plan like hell. Every door I walk through, but then when I go to the set, I try and panic my mind. Every set I go to every day, I just panic my mind and say, the eyes to pakata jaga. You know, today they'll find you just a con man, you're not a director. Anything to panic my mind. Or I'll listen to Nasir Patel Khan to understand chaos. So that at that moment of saying what the first shot is, I have no idea. Because I do know about creativity is the three most important words that I said about is I don't know. So I have to get into the stage after all that planning into the state of I don't know. And then wait for the universe to give me a pointer. That's how you do it. And then I start. Since you've spoken about directing, Poona Mota, one of our members, is asking, so when you are directing, do you spoon feed your artists or do you let them use their own creative inputs? Uh, we bounce off each other with a lot of love and trust. Like a combination. Maybe. Yeah, it's a combination. Like with children, I allow them to do what they want and I film what they want because what they do is so much more interesting than what adults do. True. True. And Mukul Agarwal, another member, has asked, it's all about perception, which is so beautiful. How would you describe the universe and have you found your purpose? I found my purpose. It's purposelessness. <laughs> How can there be a purpose? I mean, what is the purpose of life? People say, is there life after death? And I ask them, is there life before death? You know, if that everything is a contradiction. So how can you find a purpose that does not have a contradiction? If there was no death, there would be no life. If there was no Big Bang, there would be... Big Bang was uh, a rebellion against stillness. Everything in the universe, everything, everything in our thought process is a contradiction, a conflict. So then a purpose also has to be a conflict. 
True. They cannot be a singularity of a purpose. They cannot be a singular purpose because if you have a singular purpose, then you're dead. You know, the only singular purpose is that. So, well, life exists in constant contradiction, constant conflict of purpose. So, I could say, for the life of a purpose is life itself. Uh, conflict itself is a purpose. And we'll take a last question from Aditi. And she says, what does an empty canvas mean to you? What do you feel uh, like when you look at an empty canvas? An empty canvas is compulsion. It's compulsion is compulsion, it's fear. Because fear is a contradiction to confidence. An empty canvas, you need a lot of vulnerability, a lot of humility, and a lot of fear. And then finally, the combination of these four words, you put into purpose and you put into courage and that courage actually allows you to make the first stroke of the brush against the canvas. Okay. So you've drawn many hats. Very well said. Very well said. As you've drawn many hats, this is the last question. You've been an actor, a director, a writer and a producer. Which is the one that you enjoy the most? This is from Shreya. Oh, that's oh. for me. Sorry. I was, you were looking at me, so I was wondering. <laughs> you can take that, actually, because you've both done so many hats. No, 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 that's for him. Sorry, I thought I was, my mind was wandering, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've actually never worn a hat. I've just <laughs> been through processes that happened, so it's not like... So, what is... The, the question is, what is my next hat, or I've worn so many hats, or... Which is the one that you've enjoyed the most? I've enjoyed a sense of being. There's nothing that I've not been afraid of. There's nothing that I've not been in fear of. There's nothing that I've not enjoyed. There's nothing that I've not been creative of. So a combination of all these things. So I can say that I've enjoyed every moment and I've been afraid of every moment and I've been glorious in every moment and at the same time inglorious in every moment. You know, that's sort of saying. So we are, our mind is different is searching constantly for definition and to define is to confine and and so i am not able to confine myself and to say i enjoyed this moment or this hat the most it just hats after hats after hats as they come at me and so if i start to ask where which i but yeah in a very certain way i enjoy directing the most yeah i should have just said that at the beginning instead of just going through the whole circle yeah Sahila, what about you? I enjoy each one of them. I think it's probably genetic. <laughs> we can't stick with one thing. Yeah, I've been a producer, director, writer, actor. I've enjoyed each one of them. I can't say which one. I mean, I'm involved in whatever I'm doing. Complete, 100%. So that's me. I can't choose. And Shekhar, while we've been talking, I've got a text message from somebody, one of my members saying, is there going to be a Pradhan Mantri 3? Is that in the pipeline? Uh, yeah, I hope there is. When I did Pradhan Mantri 1, I didn't think anybody would see it because I was told about Indian audiences on television are dumb. And I said, Chal, thiye, thoda se paise kamala, dekhe ga nahi. Then it became this huge hit. Yeah, and it's I part of the IS training. It's I'm part sorry? of the IAS. It's part of the IAS uh, preparation yeah. course. For most of the training institutes. Amazing. I I, yeah, yeah, I walked through an airport and everybody said, "Sir, your program ko our syllabus mein aapka program." So now we've just done Pradhan Mantri too. We actually today the creators of Pradhan Mantri called me and said, "What should we do next?" So we're talking about what what is next. I All checked right. it out. It had 32 million views. Pradhan Mantri. Really? Yeah, wow. 32 million views. Amazing. Is that a lot? Sounds yes, like a lot. Yes, it is. <laughs> Sounds Quite like a lot. Oh, okay. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So we're completely out of time. I'm going to now ask my vice president, Samatha Roy, to, to speak to you all and say a few words. I Samata? want to just make one point. Yes, of course, I never speak. thought he could speak Hindi so well. I was very <laughs> impressed when I saw Pradhan Mantri. And yeah. I was uh, actually secretly, you know, I was chortling away. Let's see how he comes out with those dialogues. But he did very well. <laughs> it's amazing. I watched the corruption episode last night. I said, I must have to Yeah. I think that Sumitari is coming on, I think. 
Samatati, do join us. Uh, Samatati, you have to unmute yourself. A big thanks to amazing film director, producer, Shekhar Kapoor, and multi-talented Sahila Kapoor for your highly enjoyable conversation between two iconic siblings. Thanks for sharing stories from your rich life experiences. Much appreciated your effort to create social awareness for better today and tomorrow through the medium of cinema. Really grateful to both of you for giving time. Thanks Thank to members. Surely you have enjoyed the program. Thanks media for support. Stay safe. See you soon in the next webinar. Now over to President Dia Jaiswal. It truly has been such a magical webinar. And the beautiful bond that we have all witnessed between you both is so special and I think has made all of us smile from the heart today. Thank you once again, Shekhar Kapoor and Sohila Kapoor for being so candid, so open and so honest. We hope you're going to have the pleasure of having you both in Kolkata in the near future, maybe once the vaccine is out. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy and we wish you and all our members a lovely weekend ahead. Thank, Thank you. you all one. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.